This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. Design is a continuous component of the product development process. As design software becomes more sophisticated, we're beginning to see its imprint in next generation products. CAD software is developing rapidly. It's moving to the cloud, it's beginning to offer practical generative design features, and more generally, it's bringing an understanding of manufacturing upward into the design process so that designers can not only be aware of manufacturing's limitations, but they can also fully explore the range of possibilities that a manufacturing process might present. That's the subject of our podcast today, and it's also something we talk about a lot in the Digital Factory Report, which you can download for free at digitalfactory.xyz. The Digital Factory Report takes a broad look at recent advances in artificial intelligence, automation, and additive manufacturing, and it talks about some of the new business models that are arising from progress in those fields. You can download the Digital Factory Report for free at digitalfactory.xyz. My guest today is Steve Hooper. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Fusion 360 at Autodesk. Steve, thanks for joining me. Thank you, John. It's good to be here. Now, as the head of Fusion 360, uh, you oversee a handful of different product lines that appear to represent sort of what Autodesk sees as the future of manufacturing and the way that uh, different tasks that make up the design process sort of come together. So uh, what do you see changing in design and engineering these days? What's the, uh, what's the big evolution that's going on that you're looking at as you're developing this portfolio? Sure, I think there are a couple of things that we see uh, as big paradigm shifts for our customers. I think the first one is more accessible, advanced forms of manufacturing capability. Because our, our belief is that when you start to embrace some of these um, more accessible forms of advanced manufacturing process, things like 3D printing in metals or robotics or more accessible forms of NC controlled machinery, you have to start rethinking how you design. Um, for instance, you know, a very simple example is that if you're used to designing components um, from stock materials, you're taught as a design engineer that the more changes you introduce to that raw material, the more cost you're introducing to the product. So inherently, as a design engineer, you're taught that at a fundamental level, the more air you introduce into a design by drilling holes or milling pockets out, the more cost you're introducing. But if you think about a process like 3D printing as an example, it actually turns that equation on its head. In that respect, with a 3D printing process, the more material you add, the more cost you're introducing. And in fact, there's actually less cost for complexity. If you have a lattice structure in the manufacturing process, it's actually cheaper to produce than a solid lump of metal. And that seems like a fairly obvious thing, but it's a big paradigm shift for the mental process of design. And so our belief is that unless you fully integrate those design and manufacturing techniques as a part of a conjoined process, you won't refactor the way you design. So the two are kind of inherently and intrinsically linked together. So does that wind up introducing some complexity then? That you're not just thinking to yourself, you know, uh, this will be machined away, so I want to keep the shape as simple as possible and leave as much of the stock material on as possible. But now you have to understand um, the entire manufacturing process from beginning to end and incorporate it into your design? I think you, you can look at it as introducing complexity or you can look at it as unlocking creative freedom, unconstraining the designer, because the types of geometry that you can now physically produce cost effectively become um, radically wider. Mm. Um, so I think, yes, you have to have a broader consideration for the manufacturing process that's being applied, but as a designer or an engineer, it unlocks creative freedom and potential for design concepts. And I think the trick of software and the, um, the task that we have as a vendor of that software is to help remove that complexity or reduce that complexity for our users so that they can embrace these new paradigms. Um, that's where really software adds value in that overall process. So the idea then is that uh, the designer or the engineer at the beginning of the design process can consider the capabilities of manufacturing rather than thinking of it as a constraint. So how do you create software that you know conveys that creative range, that, that range of possibilities? That's the trick. So 
you mentioned that our organization is fairly broad. And the reason for that is that we inherited all of the different technologies in our design and manufacturing portfolio, specifically with the task of being able to build not a task-based solution for a specific element of that process, but to build a complete platform on which you can move fluidly from conceptual ideation all the way to manufacturing instructions and execution on the shop floor. The reason we did that was if you can build a conjoined process to start with, you can then start to automate it. You can start to automate the handoff between information across that process, and then you can effectively help customers move away from a linear process um, to something that's more cyclical and iterative. Um, that allows them to understand the implications of the manufacturing process by defining what tools they have access to, and that helps them make more informed decisions earlier in the process as they start out with that initial ideation and concept development. So a key part of the idea of uh, you know, parametric CAD software is that you have these dependencies that arise from uh, parameters and formulas. So maybe the width of one part is defined as the width of another part subtracted from the width of a third part. When you change the width of the third part, uh, the width of the first part gets changed as well because there's this kind of cascading dependency. So are you suggesting that by bringing all of these different capabilities together, uh, you can actually create dependencies that go a across different engineering and design disciplines? So that maybe when the electrical engineer uh, redesigns a part, that the, uh, the enclosure might sort of uh, automatically adapt around it. That's exactly what we can do. And because we host the data in the cloud, um, even today, what you can do between an Eagle user and a Fusion user is if the Eagle user starts to make changes to the board layout, we can recompute the physical mechanical geometry in the cloud so that the next time you open that design, you're able to see the updated design without any human intervention. Um, so that starts to lower the kind of workload on human beings to process um, these updates to designs mm -hmm. and to automate that process. But if you take it a step further, if you think about um, intrinsically being able to take the manufacturing know-how, capture that as part of an iterative process where we can connect the definition of the topology to simulation of its behavioral characteristics to an understanding of the manufacturing constraints that you have. And then if we iterate on that in the cloud, that's pretty much the generative design concept. We allow you as the designer to specify what machine tools you have access to and the constraints in that manufacturing process to find the requirements that you're trying to solve for the customer's need, and then use the software to iteratively solve not once, but maybe a thousand different solution alternatives based on that know-how so that you as the designer can then pick the right design with the right number of trade-offs between them. Um, inherently, that's that's what generative design is. It right. enables us to transform the design and manufacturing process by blending design and manufacturing together and using simulation in the background iteratively to arrive at optimized results, depending on the types of trade-offs you want to make. And ultimately, that generative design could encompass practically everything that's kind of a, an input into the design. Exactly. Ultimately, what we're trying to build is a platform on which you can build a complete product definition. Mm -hmm that includes all of the characteristics of the design, whether they're electronic or physical, uh, behavioral characteristics. Our belief is that if we can create a platform capable of building that definition, then we can start to help automate the definition, or at least pieces of it under the control and guidance of designers and mechanical engineers and manufacturing experts who input their domain expertise, yeah. So conventionally you have this very sort of uh, industrialized separation of roles where you have, you know, an electrical engineer whose domain is precisely defined as the, uh, as the circuitry within a product and another person who's an industrial engineer whose domain is the outside of the enclosure uh, and, and so on. So uh, in the future of design, do you think these uh, lines between these domains persist or do they start to blur uh, as these people begin to think differently about what they're doing? I think those lines will always persist to a degree because there's always some level of specialization. But what we're ultimately trying to achieve is to help our customers move away from task-based software to a software that serves their persona. So there'll always be a need for specialist capabilities. Uh, and those specialist capabilities we can serve up to people on demand. 
Um, that's another powerful thing about the cloud is that we can configure the solution to precisely match the needs of the persona that's using it. Our belief is that by providing a base level of generalist access from concept definition through to production, we can build a backbone on which everyone involved in a product development process can contribute wherever they might be in the world, at whatever stage of the process they might be at, and the information that they contribute enriches a single centralized data model that's hosted in the cloud. And we've seen this happen in other industries. Um, Salesforce has done it with CRM. HubSpot's done it in marketing. What all of these vendors have done is build a single centralized hosted data model through which anyone in the organization, whoever they might be, whatever information or data they create, that data contributes to enriching that centralized information store. That means you can make more informed decisions and you can lever leverage the power of the organization holistically rather than an individual who's kind of task bound. And so our belief is that in the world of design and manufacturing, we're yet to see that happen. Mm. All of the vendors that we see in the market today provide very much task-based solutions. They're either 3D CAD tools or manufacturing CAM tools. And even in CAM, it's focused on additive or subtractive. Um, we see rendering tools, we see CFD tools, we see structural analysis tools. All of these tools are finely tuned to perform an individual task. And those tasks aren't easily linked together to provide mm -hmm. any level of interoperability, automation, and nowhere near what we would call intelligence. So we think by linking them together, we provide a better individual user experience for the professional, for the organization that professional works in, we help enrich information at the core of their business so that they can start to make much more informed decisions and derive far higher levels of data abstraction. Ultimately, our goal is also to provide at the customer level more insight and metrics on the usage of software. So we're looking at new innovative ways at which we can help customers understand the usage characteristics of their organization so then they can make more informed decisions about how to train individuals or departments or maybe even how to construct teams so that specialist capabilities are complementary and work together on a specific project that has those needs or requirements. So that's interesting, this idea of measuring uh, the steps within the design process. It's analogous to what you would see in a factory where you're measuring uh, the time that, uh, that it takes to do every single step in the production process and you're using the data to inform training efforts and to improve the, the, the way that the process is laid out. Yeah, like I said, one of the interesting applications is to look at complementary skills that are required for a particular project and put together the optimal team to serve that project. So, you know, if any of your listeners are interested in taking part in something like that, please reach out to me. We'd love to work with a few pilot customers on, on projects like that. And like I said, we can selectively turn these types of capabilities on for people so they can provide feedback. And when it's ready, we'll put it into preview for everyone. So there's been this dream for a little while, especially among uh, software developers who get into creating hardware and, and physical devices, that as uh, the design software improves and as the processes get more accessible and more flexible, that uh, the process of designing hardware might someday become as fluid uh, and as dynamic as the process of developing software. Do you think we'll ever get to that point? I think we'll get progressively towards that point. I think software development is just another form of engineering. Um, in software development, we'll build a structural diagram and a class diagram to help us understand a complex um, system through which you know, many different objects interact. That's no different to a, um, you know, from a physical product development process. There are many common characteristics, even some of the terminology between the two disciplines is used interchangeably. So I, I think one inherently has more constraints bound by the physical world than the other, um, but we're learning how to overcome those and I think we'll get closer and closer. I think there'll always be a lag maybe between the two mm -hmm. and we can learn from one to the other, um, but ultimately, yeah, that's the goal. So beyond the frontline design and engineering processes that you've mentioned, uh, that arise from having all of the software and the product development process on a unified platform. What are the business consequences or the commercial consequences? What does this mean uh, for a business that's trying to you know, develop products for different markets? I think from a, an adoption perspective, I saw some interesting insights this morning. Um, so I was meeting with a consortium that were um, over at our peer facility in San Francisco. 
Um, and part of that consortium with, was the Georgia Technology Institute. And we had a little presentation from the, some of their students who are working with Fusion 360. What they're also doing is connecting their machine tools um, with IoT devices to tap into the information of the production process. And so from a customer's point of view, now what they're able to do is to look at the physical performance of the manufacturing process as it's in operation. They can see um, you know, the loading on a spindle. Um, they can see the acceleration of the tool uh, as it moves through its cutting path, and they can feed that information back. Now, the opportunity for an adopter of that software is to start to use that information to iteratively improve the machining strategies and close the loop on the physical manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. So to your point earlier about are we starting to see some of the um, iterative processes that we know in the software industry work so well applied to the physical domain, this really represents the opportunity to do exactly that. But of course, you can only do that if you build a holistic platform where you can close the loop and bring that information back into the product's definition or the definition of the manufacturing process to iteratively improve it. So I would say that that's one potential benefit for customers. Another is that um, by connecting these processes together, we can start to create um, automations like generative design. We can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually automate many different elements of the design and manufacturing process that you couldn't do before because these processes were disconnected. So do you think we could really get to a point then where everything is dynamic and fluid uh, down to the point where, you know, day to day, uh, every Ford Explorer that rolls off the assembly line is slightly different because the design is being continuously improved to reflect both, you know, engineering improvements and, uh, you know, marketing improvements. It, it's difficult for um, manufacturers in certain industries. So obviously for heavily legislated industries like aerospace and automotive to a degree, they have to maintain a tighter control over the revisioning process that they employ. Um, I do see that improving in the future. I think there are a number of technologies that will help manufacturers embrace that. One of the constraints has always been spare part provision, for mm -hmm. example. So you couldn't be constantly changing the effective effectivity dates of um, components because you'd need to stock inventory for spare mm -hmm. part commissioning. Um, but I think as you start to see the advent of more additive manufacturing processes, especially in the spare parts industry, it will open up greater flexibility. Um, I was showing you an example earlier today of uh, a couple of upright um, supports from a wheel assembly on a vehicle. And traditionally, these things would be manufactured in bulk and stored in inventory. And as a consequence, the left and the right hand versions would be identical. Uh, but when you start to employ some more of these flexible manufacturing processes where you can vary the manufacturing process on demand um, or you can print on demand and just stock the raw material, it enables you to print with more variability or manufacture with more variability. Um, and I think there you might see manufacturers start to adopt some of the more iterative product development techniques we see in the software world in the physical domain. And you, you might well see constant updates to product lines because there'll be more flexibility in how you service those product lines in field. So this kind of distributed manufacturing that you're describing, where uh, you can have a product living as a digital asset and then manufacture it in a lot of different places, it would seem to depend on having extremely well-defined manufacturing capabilities uh, in the software, right? So that you know that a product machined on one mill in one country is completely identical to the product uh, machined on a different mill in a different country. So do you think we're there? Do you think that the manufacturing ecosystem as a whole is uh, well enough defined? Or is that something that still needs to be improved? Again, it really depends on the industry in which you're operating. I think for something like aerospace or auto, probably not. Um, but for many industries, yeah, I think it's, it's even achievable today. And of course, it will continue to improve. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an area. Test and validation of manufactured um, variants is, is obviously like an important subject for, for many people that we're working on. So let's talk about generative design for a minute. Uh, you just rolled out a big update, and this is something that's been a demonstration project at Autodesk for a few years known as Dreamcatcher, and then it's become a product that's actually in commercial release and that people can use. So um, is this something that you think any designer is going to start using as part of their workflow, or is it still kind of a speculative or specialized thing? 
No, we think any designer. Um, we're really excited about this. So for us, this represents what we think is one of the next big paradigm shifts in design. Um, it really is the ability to move away from coming up with a design concept and then spending hours just building topology in a 3D modeler without really adding any value to the conceptual design you've already got in your head. You're just documenting it in 3D and then sequentially testing it in an FEA environment uh, before moving into CAM. That's that very linear process we talked about. Where we see generative design as transformative is it takes those three processes and instead of running them in a linear process, it moves them together into a iterative cyclical process that applies some machine learning technology, runs in the cloud. So basically what we're able to do is take a number of requirements that define a customer's need, set up the manufacturing constraints, and then have the system iterate through a number of different variants and present the user not with one optimized solution, but maybe with a thousand different potential results that are all optimized for different trade-offs. Um, and that means that as a designer or a manufacturer, you can spend your time on making the important trade-off decisions between time, weight, material, cost, requirements that serve your customer versus sitting there and just producing 3D geometry. So it's kind of our goal not to eliminate designers or manufacturers from this process, but to empower them with these tools so that they're able to do a lot more in a limited space of time with less material, less resource, and outpace their competitors in terms of innovation. So we're pretty excited about this, this stuff. Um, like I said, you can't consider it in isolation. If you just look at topology optimization as a singular solution in its own right, it doesn't help you innovate any faster. It just helps you reduce weight. You really need to look at a divergent process like generative design, which delivers not one result, but hundreds. And even then, disconnecting it from the manufacturing process wouldn't serve you very well. You need to be able to take the output of that process, not as a mesh, but as a B-rep, a T-spline body that you can continue to work with, and then move it seamlessly through into the manufacturing environment and start to set up either an additive process like we've just introduced, or a subtractive process, or a hybrid combination of the two. So we've actually, um, we've actually previewed our new manufacturing environment as well. So instead of moving through to CAM, if you now move through to our manufacturing environment, you can specify the type of machine you're going to use. And if you say you're going to use a Renishaw 3D printer, for example, uh, your component design will be moved into a bed and you'll be able to develop the support structures to 3D print it. But then you'll also be able to move on to a subsequent operation, which might be a subtractive machining operation to drill holes in that component. And you'll be able to do all of that in one single environment. So it's not just the generative design of the topology, it's also capturing the manufacturing knowledge and then providing the user with the tools to actually be able to physically produce the product as well. Well, this is another area where you could talk about sort of the blurring lines between the disciplines in the process. Conventionally, you might have design and design for manufacturing as separate steps, and these groups of people talk to each other and their loops and so on. But in this case, it sounds like you're describing manufacturing as an input to the design at the very earliest stages. Yeah, and that's one of the strengths of generative design is that you can spe specify the machining constraints or the manufacturing constraints. So even today, you can specify whether it's an additive process, you can choose the type of material, you can choose whether it's five axis or three axis subtractive, and you'll get different results depending on those constraints. Um, so we do embed some of that knowledge already as part of the process. So when you take generative design from being a pretty specialized tool into being a pretty generalized tool, what do you start to see? I mean, have you seen evidence from uh, companies that are using this that it's really changing the way that entire teams of designers and engineers can work? Yes. So, um, you know, I think one of the benefits in making the tools more accessible like this is you get broader spread of adoption across an organization. So one analogy I liked um, when I was younger and I worked as a mechanical engineer in the UK, I used to use a, a pretty like specialized piece of um, design software, Unix based. It was very expensive. We could only afford about 10 workstations shared amongst 20 of us. Um, highly specialized, very productive. And our design director at the time decided to switch it out um, for AutoCAD. And I remember asking him at the time, you know, this is super capable, very sophisticated software. Why are we swapping it out? And he said to me, Steve, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good question. For you personally, you might find this particular piece of software 
is the most productive for your individual task. But for the same level of investment, I can equip everyone in the organization with access to the same set of technology. And that means anything that you produce, others can pick up and contribute information to it. Um, they can print it. The plant layout guys can use the output from your work. People down in the production environment, um, they can interact with it. They can work on it in production engineering for jigs and fixtures design. And so we get a higher performing productivity from the organization as a whole versus just focusing on one task or one individual. And I think the same thing's true here. And I think you guys have a similar philosophy with your printers as well, is that mm -hmm. for the same level of investment that you might make in a super high-end piece of equipment, you can allow everyone in the organization to gain benefits of a similar level. Um, and that kind of shared understanding and shared benefit yields a greater result for the organization as a whole than it does if you pour all of that investment into one specialist. Uh, and I've always used to say, you know, like a high performing team is always worth more than a star player. Um, of course, if you can have a whole team of star players, that's great. <laughs> um, but I, I think in this case, you know, that's what we're focused on is, is really trying to bring the best of everything together in one platform. Yeah, that is something we talk about uh, a lot at Formlabs, that at a company, you give everyone in your sales team access to Salesforce. You give all of your employees access to email. You give everyone on the factory floor access to, you know, quality management software. And so uh, if you can give everyone in your organization access to the kinds of resources uh, that they can use to inform the work that they're doing, then that can be extremely powerful. So have you ever read Ready Player One? No, I haven't. It's on my list. There's one concept from that book, um, which is kind of interesting, which is like everyone gets access to the Oasis, right? And the nice thing about that is that the cost of our access to the Oasis is very low. Um, I think it's a quarter in the book. Um, now, if you want to use some very specialist equipment or tools when you're there, you can pay for those. Um, but you only pay for what you want to use. And that's kind of a philosophy that we've got. Um, so we want to give everyone access to the best of everything. And if you have very specific needs or requirements in a very specialist area, you can tap into those and turn them on in the same user experience and just pay for those on demand. And still you're enjoying the same user experience paradigm and you're contributing to and enriching the same source data model, um, but you're not flooding everyone with everything. So the cloud provides that kind of flexibility to access as well, which is also interesting. All right, I'd like to move on to our recurring question. On every single episode, I ask the guest about his or her favorite tool. So Steve Hooper, what is your favorite tool? There are so many ways you could answer this question. It's a great question. The one I'm going to go with, though, um, and I'm inspired, just sat in my office here, I'm looking at it right now, is my Pocket NC. I love this Pocket NC. I, I mean, there are, there are other tools that are equally good in the same sort of category. But what I, I like about it, and it's, it's purely because I have one and I use it, is that it takes something like five axis machining and it makes it incredibly accessible to experiment with. I mentioned the guys from Georgia Tech that provided the presentation to me earlier today. They too were using a, a Pocket NC hmm. and they were using it to just reclaim some of the um, manufacturing data as they were actually machining on it. Um, and, and it's because it's so accessible that they're able to do that. So they're not experimenting on like a $2 million workstation. They're able to experiment uh, very flexibly with access to a five access machining um, on a desktop. And I think it, it kind of reminds me of when we got our first pen plotter in the mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. And I remember all of us crowding around it going, that's amazing. And then a couple of years later, it must have been like three years later, I guess, the very first sort of wax printers came in. And one of my colleagues had one and was able to print what looked like a photograph, which was mind blowing. Because at that point, to get a photograph you know, produced, you had to go to a local chemist with a film roll and have it developed. And here was somebody who could take a digital image and then produce what looked like a photograph on a desktop. And it seemed crazy. And I remember people saying, well, that's never going to catch on. This is going to take like 10 minutes to print each photograph. And yet here we are, you know, a couple of decades later and everyone's got printers on their desktops and can produce any literature that they want. And I see a similar thing here in 3D when you look at some of these desktop machine tools. Firstly, they make that kind of technology incredibly accessible, which is great from an educational point of view. It just helps people understand concepts involved. And that can't be underestimated because 
you know, we talked about this convergence between design and manufacturing. A big piece of that is just an appreciation for the manufacturing process. If you spend half a day playing with a, a tool like a Pocket NC, you quickly get the appreciation of how difficult it's going to be to produce a piece of 3D geometry because you have to get a machine tool in there. And it's surprising how many of us forget that or overlook that on a daily basis. So I think just equipping people with the tools to be able to do that in their office environment on their desktop helps them prototype faster. It helps them reinforce some of those manufacturing um, domain disciplines more as they think about manufacturing when they design. And then I just love the fact that it's opening that technology up to students and a whole new generation of users. It's really bridging the divide between hobbyist, education and the professional in a way I don't think we've seen done for a long time. So that's why I'd pick it. I think it's, it's a pretty <laughs> ingenious tool. Yeah, I completely agree. Firsthand experience is so important if you want to really understand something at a fundamental level and try something new. But until recently, it's been very difficult to get firsthand access to machine tools and manufacturing equipment. You know, as, as Zach Kaplan pointed out on an earlier episode of this podcast, um, imagine if you were a computer programmer and you didn't have full-time firsthand access to a computer. If you had to write a program and email it to someone else to run it and send the results back to you a few days later. But that's kind of where a lot of people have been until very recently when they want to try something new in a manufacturing process. If you went to the production manager at a factory and asked to take a mill offline for a couple of days to try out a new idea, you know, they would just laugh and turn you down. Exactly. And I just think, you know, there's a time and a place for specialization. Obviously, it's a necessity. But I think having a generalist appreciation also helps um, build more innovation into your product development process. It also helps avoid costly mistakes. And it also, probably most importantly for most manufacturers, helps them really engineer cost out of their product development process earlier in the process. And that, that's important for all of us. Steve, if listeners want to find you online and uh, see what folks are doing with the software you've built, where should they look? Great place to start is on our Facebook uh, users page, the Fusion 360 user group. Thriving community there. Um, always happy to engage one-to-one -one through that medium. Or on Twitter, obviously. You can find me on Twitter or any of my team. Uh, the thing I like about both those mediums is the engagement's all public and everyone benefits from it. So that's probably the best way to do it. Steve Hooper is the Vice President and General Manager of Fusion 360 at Autodesk. Steve, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Thanks for talking to me, John. For links related to this week's episode, including some of the software that Steve and his team have built, as well as Steve's favorite tool, be sure to check out the show notes that accompany this episode in your podcast app. If you're interested in learning more about generative design and the role that it plays in the factory of the future, alongside fields like artificial intelligence and advanced automation, be sure to download the Digital Factory Report. It's available for free at digitalfactory.xyz. For the Digital Factory Podcast, I'm John Bruner.